welcome everyone. Uh, so nice to see you all here today. Uh, if you want to share in the chat where you're calling in from, that's always nice to see and maybe a word or two about how you're feeling um, and yeah, what maybe you're excited about in this conversation. Uh, so I uh, am going to just jump right in because I know we have a very full program and I don't want to take any minutes away from that. Uh, my name is Dara Kosberg, and I am the program director at Reimagine, uh, which is a nonprofit organization that creates experiences like this one um, that really uh, let people uh, explore the hardest parts of our existence, including serious illness and death, uh, while celebrating life and one another. And um, Today, uh, we are here for past and present with Allison Gilbert, uh, Mary Fetchett, and Wanda Irving, um, who you'll hear from in just a moment. Um, I just have a few housekeeping things to do, and then we can get started. Um, so first off, I'd like to take a moment and offer a huge thank you uh, to our um, sponsor, uh, Domani for Grief, for their support of this series. Uh, and then also I'd like to thank um, our Reimagine 2021 sponsors who are shown here that help uh, support Reimagine and make this work possible. Um, I also want to thank um, all who've donated to Reimagine um, on this call. Uh, as you know, any you know kind of donation really helps um, lets us offer free events like this one. And um, all of you should know, probably Zoom at this point, um, we invite you to keep your cameras on if possible, but of course keep them off if not. Um, if you uh, find the chat distracting, you can always just close it um, by clicking that little button in the top right hand corner. We also have a live um, captioning um, on and at the bottom of your screen, you should see a little CC and you can um, see the transcription as well. And um, and I just want to actually um, share something uh, new uh, for Reimagine. Uh, this, um, we just launched our fall season, uh, which is called Grief, Growth, and Action. Uh, and uh, basically, the idea is that um, there's going to be a thread throughout all of our events um, that uh, around facing the hardest parts of life and um, exploring how we can transform adversity, loss, and mortality into meaningful action. Uh, and uh, we have a, an intention that we will be reading at all of our events um, throughout the fall season, um, which I'll share right now. Uh, so there is no life without death, no love without loss, no growth without action. Let's move forward together not in leaps and bounds, but in small, sweet steps. In the face of distance, illness, racism, and isolation, we are reimagining a changed world, kinder, slower, smaller. We are reimagining the giving and receiving of love, the cycles of loss and new beginnings, and what it means to be fully alive. This is how we move. This is how we transform. This is how we grow, and this is how we take action. So at the end of the event, we will be sharing a very short survey for you to share a small, sweet step that you're interested in taking that is inspired by what you'll hear today. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce Allison and let her take it away. Uh, Allison Gilbert is an Emmy award-winning journalist and really one of the most thought-provoking and influential writers on grief and resilience. She is the author of numerous books, including the groundbreaking Past and Present, Keeping Memories of Loved Ones Alive. Her stirring work exposes the secret and essential factor for harnessing loss to drive happiness and rebound from adversity. She serves on the board of directors for the National Alliance of uh, Grieving Children. And with that, um, I'm going to stop my share and welcome Allison. Thank you so much, Dara. I am so happy it is the final Thursday of the month because if it's the final Thursday of the month, that means we are back 
for another past and present conversation as part of this series. Um, and I'm so grateful uh, to you, Dara, and for the entire We Imagine team for being such incredible partners. Um, I'm really just moved um, already in preparation for today's conversation with Mary and Wanda. I am uh, floored by their work. They are both leaders in their respective worlds. And in large measure, we're going to trace back where their, that story started for them uh, in terms of their losing their children which we will talk about today. I imagine uh, there are many of you who have chosen to join this Zoom call today because you have lost a child. And that is why we've created this event to give that unique loss space and to talk about it from various angles. Because as you will hear, Wanda's experience is not the same. All loss, as we know, is not the same. And Mary's experience is quite different. So thank you for being here. A few things of housekeeping. I am very good with time. If you've come before to a past and present event, you know I end on time. So you will be out of here by two o'clock Eastern time, 11 a.m. Pacific. So the reason why I'm bringing this up at about the half hour mark, I will open the floor to your questions. And so don't waste time. We will not stay longer than two o'clock. If you do have a question for Wanda or Mary, I just want you to get out of this what you came for. Ask the questions. And how we're going to ask the questions is to put your thoughts, your reflections, your questions into the chat. Christina, if you can wave, you're wearing that red, pink, cute top today. She's gonna go through the chat for us on our behalf, see which questions bubble up to the surface in terms of being applicable to more people um, than perhaps something that's just unique to you. So Christina will be our go-to looking for your questions in the chat. So. I'm excited to begin. So I want to start, if you don't mind, um, with Wanda. Wanda Irving, I am uh, excited to speak with you because I personally have been your stalker, a big fan. I saw you give your TED Talk um, and I was moved. We have been promoting this event today with the link to that talk. So I'm sure there are many people who have also uh, been so moved. And I want to talk about your daughter. Your daughter was an epidemiologist. She was with the CDC. We are all very familiar with the Centers for Disease Control <laughs> right now because of COVID-19. Right. She right. had two master's degrees, a dual subject PhD. Your daughter was incredibly bright. Your, your daughter knew how to advocate for herself to ask the questions that she needed to do to get the proper health care. Um, before we get into what happened, tell us more. Um, tell us about your daughter. <laughs> My daughter, uh, well, first, let me say thank you very much for having me here, Allison. Um, my daughter, Shalon, was an amazing person. And I don't say that lightly or because I'm her mother. She just was an incredible human being. Uh, she loved to learn, and, which is evident in her degrees. Um, she also was a certified health education specialist. Um, she was in the Epidemic Intelligence Services, um, and she was with the U.S. Public Health Service as a lieutenant commander. So um, she had no lack of uh, different, different titles. Uh, she, was, she was incredible. Uh, she had a deep passion for health equity and racial equality for women, especially women of color. 
outside of work. She was successful and well-rounded. She was an exceptional cook. In fact, she had applied and gotten accepted to, uh, what was it? What's that chef show with, um, oh, you know what I'm talking, Master Chef. Oh my goodness. She had planned to do that. She was just uh, she, incredible. She was an accomplished photographer. She was an avid gardener, an entrepreneur. She just launched a consulting startup um, just a couple of months before we lost her. Um, she was a devotee of home and holidays. She loved decorating the house and the joy and the, the holiday seasons. Um, she had an incredible sense of humor. She was warm, generous, and a fiercely loyal friend. You know, you just, you, when you met her, you'd never forget her. Her smile was electric. She was warm and generous. You she, can tell, you could see all that <laughs> in that picture. Her smile is yes. radiant. And I know with all her schooling, I don't know this for sure, but she was so accomplished. Uh, she had um, her pregnancy. Um, she died when she was 36. 36. And, and I do want to talk um, about that. And of course, Mary, I have not forgotten about you at all, Mary Fetchett. But I want to talk um, about, about what happened at 36. This is what a, her best friend had to say about her death. She was at high risk for life-threatening issues related to pregnancy and childbirth just for being a Black woman. And I would like you to explain that. And want I should say that you are managing partner of Irving Associates. You yourself provide consulting and leadership coaching services to nonprofits. You have a bright daughter. You are exceptionally, um, you know, well educated yourself. And yet, despite that, her best friend says it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. Help us understand what happened with your daughter. From day one, Shalon did everything right. She followed her OB's advice, uh, orders to the letter. She did her um, pre birth uh, plan. She she exercised, she was in a marathon, she didn't smoke, she drank maybe socially a glass of wine. She did everything she was supposed to do and she had a textbook delivery. But um, what I didn't know then and what I know now is that three out of four women die. Well, it's what is it? Three Black women are three to four times more likely to die than white women. And what also surprised me was black women with college degrees are five times more likely to die. Now, um, that I, I still don't understand that. And I've tried talking with a couple of doctors to please explain to me how the better educated you are, the more likely you are to die. Um, and every year, over 800 women die from maternal mortality, uh, some pregnancy related uh, complication or childbirth related complication. So uh, Shalon died three weeks after the birth of her daughter. And it wasn't a surprise. After about five or six days, Shalon started to, to develop symptoms of um, edemia. She, was not voiding, she was gaining weight, she had um, rapidly elevating blood pressure, her leg was swollen. We went to the doctor time and time again, no fewer than seven times in two weeks. And each time it was like they patted her on the head and sent her home and saying, don't worry, you know, we've got this, um, it, you just had a baby, give it time things will get better, but they didn't get better. And she kept going. She went, I think I went with her on her last visit, which was on the 24th of January. We went in and the nurse had to take the blood pressure twice because it was high the first time and she 
said, oh, let me do this again, because this is awfully high. And she did it. Um, and it was still high, of course. And she said, let me go get the doctor. She came back 10, 15 minutes later and said, well, he is tied up right now. Um, he said to take these pills and you know, come back later. And it's like, no, we're not leaving. There's something wrong with her. So, well, maybe it's a blood clot. Shalon said, no, I've had a blood clot because she has factor five Leiden. She says, I know what that is like. This is not a blood clot. And the nurse was insist insisting that it was. So we went down to the emergency room and this is all while carrying around her baby who was three weeks old and suffered from GERDs. And we're going from hospital room to hospital room and down to the emergency room. And we waited down there and waited. They took the, the um, images. We waited for the results. And of course it was not a blood clot. We went back up to the doctor's office, could not see the doctor again. He was too busy to come in that time. And so she gave her the prescription and we went home because there was nothing we could do. Uh, at least um, nothing else that she wanted to do at that time. She says, I've got to get my baby home. I've got to get out of this environment. And the baby was hungry and of course fussy. So we went back home and I remember distinctly watching my daughter walk from the car, you know, through her um, front yard into the house. And I've just never seen her like that. It was like she, like the life had been sucked out of her. And, um, and I, I know now that she must have felt that impending doom that you know, she just wasn't listened to, she wasn't believed, and there was nothing she could do about it. I can just imagine how that felt. And we went home, she was you know, pumping her breast to, to get milk for the baby because she didn't feel well um, enough to sit up and feed the baby. And um, I was holding her and we were talking and in fact, we were talking about a trip we were supposed to take in five days. Um, we were going to Dubai um, because Shalon loved to travel and she had already gotten the baby a passport um, at two weeks Wanda, old. Wanda, I, I want to I just respectfully- I'm sorry, yes. No, I, I just want to respectfully interrupt your um, reflection. And I do want to remember one part of your- story that I want to come back to in a little mm -hmm. bit, which is that both of you were advocating, both yeah. of you were leaning forward for the health care that uh, your daughter needed. And you said, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't remember your exact words, but I believe you said, and you were turned away. The doctor was too busy. I want right. to come back to that because now you co-founded an entire organization to make sure that um, this does not happen to other women again. Uh, you named it after your daughter, Dr. Shallon's Maternal Action Project. We can put the link in the chat. We can make sure that people know about this resource. I wanna come back uh, to everything that you were just talking about before, but I do wanna bring in Mary um, because Mary suffered a whole different kind of loss with her son, Brad. We just, um, all of us in the world um, recognize the 20th anniversary of 9-11 just earlier this month. Mary's son, Brad, uh, was killed on 9-11. And I do wanna talk, Mary, about what you have done since then as well. But first, I wanna talk about Brad. Uh, 24, he had just graduated um, in 1999 from Bucknell. University. He had moved to New York City to pursue a career on Wall Street. Can you, Mary, tell us about your son, Brad? Uh, well, as you said, he was number one. Thank you for inviting uh, me, Allison. And it's so great to be here with, with Wanda. Although we suffer different losses, um, 
you know, it's all the same. It's all about loss and grief and how we get through it. Brad was 24 at the time, and he was uh, the oldest of our three boys. Uh, as you mentioned, he graduated uh, from Bucknell University. He, similarly to Wanda's daughter, had a great smile, and he was um, certainly the center. Um, he was sort of a go-to among his friends. He, he played hockey and lacrosse uh, from the time he was young up through college, so he was a very accomplished athlete. He actually started in engineering and then shifted to economics. Um, I think maybe he was in his uh, junior year at the time. Um, he was uh, very mechanical. He, you know, from the time he was young, he took a, a, apart everything. And th there are, always seemed to be a couple of extra screws <laughs> when he was putting things together. Um, he loved computers, uh, much like my dad, who was very mechanical. And um, I really relied on him. In fact, you know, to, he was teaching me right before he died how to send an email. And, you know, I shook my head many times and said, Brad, where are you when I need you? As I was starting this organization and entering a world that, you know, I was unfamiliar with, beginning with sending an email or set, saving a, a Word document. Um, See, I, was, I, want, I want to give you credit where credit's due. You mentioned the organization, but I want to name it so people can uh, look to it. Uh, Voices of September 11th is what it used to be called. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, um, we know it as the Voices Center for Resilience. You have grown your initiative since 9-11, which is remarkable. Um, you and I met because I was way too close to the unfolding events on 9-11 as a journalist working um, for NBC News that day, nearly killed. And I feel like I have gotten to know you and by extension, a little bit of Brad. And I know you have had a partnership also with the National September 11th Memorial and Museum, which helps keep Brad's memory alive in part. And you, um, and with permission, I should say, I want to relay um, the voicemail message that Brad left you on September 11th. Uh, he was in the second tower. The first tower had just been hit. Correct, Mary, and he yes. left you uh -huh. this message. Hey, mom, it's Brad. I just wanted to call and let you know that a plane crashed into the World Trade Center one. We're fine. We're in World Trade Center two. I'm obviously alive over here, but obviously a pretty scary experience. You're welcome to give me a call. I think we'll be here all day. I love you. And I wonder, so many years later, Mary, at the 20th year anniversary, you said this year was particularly tough. How does it land for you hearing that now, at least the transcript of that call, that message? Well, it would, it would have been hard. I, I'm easier playing it rather than saying it. So I appreciate you reading his message. Um, I think it's a double-edged sword. I, I love hearing his voice, but of course I hate the outcome. And um, so I think for me, um, you know, Brad's death and the death of almost 3000 others really mobilized me much like Wanda in that I didn't want it to happen you know, to another mother, another person to die in the way that they died on September 11th. And so um, at the time I was a clinical social worker. So my response was really to pull the families together and here in Connecticut, because so many of the women had lost their husbands, they couldn't go into the family assistance center and that was really the epicenter where all the decisions were being made. Um, so that was really the beginning of the organization is really to, to be at the table. Decisions were being made that were going to directly impact all of us. Um, and to read it after the fact, uh, although I did appreciate 
um, you know, the reporters um, that who are, were, were reporting out, I felt that we could only advocate uh, on behalf of ourselves. So we needed to be part of those conversations. And then that led me down a whole nother path in, in addition to um, you know, providing social service support, which we're continuing to do today. I also got very involved in, um, as other family members were, in what the memorial was to be. Um, we planned commemorative services, and then I got very involved, of course, in uh, pushing for the creation of the 9-11 Commission, which was really, you know, well out of my wheelhouse. But um, but I became a, a as other family members did, you know, an expert in, a, in intelligence reform, which is, you know, not not the typical social work um, training. What's remarkable to me about both of you, and I want to go back to Wanda right where I promised, <laughs> which is the advocacy that you did in that moment. Now you're pivoting to this macro advocacy um, with uh, Dr. Shallon's maternal action project. And I want to ask you if you were to summarize the mission and the goals, and can you separate it at all now from how it personally affects you to work? in this field now. So there's a mission, but you're also a mom. So Wanda, I'd like to toss it back to you to take on that question. Well, I think um, the reason I'm able to work in this field is because of the loss of my daughter. She had a personal mantra. It was, I see an equity wherever it exists. I'm not afraid to call it by name and I work hard to eliminate it. I vow to create a better earth. And that is what guides me, is that mantra. Um, because she can't fin finish it herself, so we are in the process of doing that. And our organization definitely takes a broader look at that as far as making sure that we provide the education, awareness, empowerment, and support to um, Black mothers, before, during, and after pregnancy so that they don't end up in the same position that I and Shalon were in. So um, if you can drill down the issues that you think have bubbled to the top for black mothers, is it access? Is it being heard? Is it, uh, tell me where you think the fault lines are in healthcare for black moms. I think the fault lines lie in racism, which is deeply embedded and ingrained in the American system. In every field, that is what is causing problems and people refuse to have the larger conversation on how do we get this out, root it out and make the playing field level for everyone. So access has to do with some women may have an access problem, but that wasn't Shalon's problem. It was definitely the fact that she wasn't listened to and she wasn't believed mm -hmm. and she wasn't respected and given the kind of help that she needed. And Mary, uh, in a different sphere, um, your mission now in that macro sense is making sure other victims, whether or not it's crime, whether or not it's some other uh, force of nature, that there is this well, this reserve of resilience to draw upon. And I'm wondering for you, tell me if I'm wrong, Mary, I remember talking to you once on the phone and you made it very clear to me, and I hope I'm not wrong, that you felt that voices is not about keeping Brad's memory alive, that this is the work that's almost independent of his death, but certainly born because of his loss. Am I remembering that conversation correctly, that this has become just so much bigger for you? Well, I think people do believe that one does this in their, in their memory. And I feel um, you know, there was a turning point for me 
when Brad became, I accepted his death and Brad became part of me. So he motivates me. It's not in his memory at all. In fact, he's, I don't want to say I don't think about him, but I'm always thinking about the other people, much like, much like Brad would. Um, but I do think the organization, um, you know, much like the failures that Wanda was up against, there were real failures and continue to be failures in working with, um, you know, victims uh, of crime, victims of terrorism, mass violence, you know, social unrest, and uh, it's a long list of tragedies that are happening here in the United States and abroad. Um, there's a short-term solution to our long-term problem. People do not grieve in the first month or the first year. It's a lifelong process, and there's going to be ups and downs and ebbs and flows uh, because there are other situations when you think about, you know, people impacted by COVID or impacted by other losses or other traumatic events. Um, and it goes back really to the philosophy that I had as a clinician that um, you have a responsibility as a professional to provide continuity of care. So people can call our office, whether it's a family member, a responder, or survivor. And we know what they've gone through for the last 20 years. They don't have to tell us, explain the challenges. We, we've been up front. We understand the challenges. And we can meet them where they are and connect them with resources, um, you know, well beyond what we're able to provide ourselves. I want to make sure that we pivot now. It's 1.32, uh, which is a perfect time to remind everyone here to get your questions into the chat. I am going to come to you in a matter of minutes. So please do get your questions in the chat. It's also a perfect time. We will never get to everything that we want to talk to Wanda Irving about, nor Mary Fetch it. So I want to remind everyone, since we are in the day of social media, where you can find these remarkable women and to continue the conversation even after we're done here at 2 o'clock Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. So uh, get out your phones. And so here's where you can find them. So on Facebook, for Mary Fetchett's organization um, on Facebook, it's Voices of September 11. On Twitter, it's Voices of September, oh no, SEPT, so an abbreviation for September, Voices of SEPT 11 on Twitter for Mary's group. And on Instagram also, it's Voices of SEPT 11. So Mary, you're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, probably more places, but that's what we're gonna go with right now. And Wanda Irving, um, for you on Facebook, Dr. Shallon's map for a maternal action project. On Twitter, it's Shallon's map again. And then for Instagram, Dr. Shallon's underscore map, but you can just find it by doing Dr. Shallon's map, I'm sure. And again, map stands for maternal action project. So I'm going to get to Christina right now to make sure you can start us off on some questions uh, for Mary Fetch and Wanda Irving. Alice, Allison, the other thing I'd say is our website, yeah. we're actually shifting all in, the, in pretty quickly um, to the Voices Center, Got it. Um, but they can go there for social media, but uh, it's voicescenter.org as our website. And that's another way to reach us. That's perfect. And I know awesome. that Christina had already put that in the uh, chat. And I believe, Christina, you also put the link to uh, Wanda Irving's organization, Dr. Shallon's Maternal Action Project, right? You're going to do that again. And you just did it again. She did it twice. Yeah. So you guys have the links to their organizations. Thank you, Mary, for making sure we can all find you. Um, which is of course the whole point. So uh, Christina, go ahead. Okay, this question's from Elizabeth. It says, how do you navigate the first holidays after the loss of a child? I don't know about Mary, but that was the hardest time in the world for me, um, especially because my daughter loved the holidays so much. And I can't even tell you how you get through those first couple of holidays. It's just, in fact, my, I'm raising my granddaughter and she hasn't had a Christmas yet. 
and she's four years old. She'll be five in January. This is gonna be her first Christmas because I think I'm now at a point where I can accept um, the fact that my daughter's not gonna be there, but her daughter is, and I've got to make it right for her. So I don't have an answer for you. You just get through it. Well, I think you get it through it with your, the help of your family and friends. I know it was really, for the first five years, I really relied on a very good friend to have us to her house for Thanksgiving and Christmas. And I, of course, um, you know, I couldn't buy a Christmas gift because I had three sons and they were all built very differently. Brad was very muscular and broad shouldered. And, you know, if I looked at something that he would have liked, that would have sent me over the edge. Um, so I really relied on my husband uh, really to, to buy Christmas gifts. The holidays are a big thing for me. Um, and I think the challenge that we have as a family, we go from September 11th mm -hmm. to Brad's birthday on November 17th, then Thanksgiving, then Christmas. So it's really the new year where we catch our breath. But it does get e easier over time. And I'd say, Wanda, you know, I remember specifically the fifth year of my friend saying, okay, this year we're having Thanksgiving at your house. So, um, so we did. So I would great. like to um, make a comment before Christina goes on to the next question. Um, a few things that I've learned over the years since my parents have died, a different kind of loss, but lessons have been learned. And I really enjoy using my senses to remember them. So whether it's eating the foods that I know they either liked to make or whether it's eating the foods that I liked for them to make for me as their daughter, the tastes and the aromas to me feel like this all important tether. Um, and I think we can do the same with music. I think there, there might be music that you remembered listening to and enjoying with your loved one, or there could be music that maybe wasn't your cup of tea, but you know your loved one like to listen to that music. And so why not have that be a part of your holiday experience? Those are just two ideas I wanted to pass on. I wrote a whole book about how to remember our loved ones. And I give 85 ideas for remembering and honoring and celebrating our loved ones. And this is not to sell it. I'm just saying, if you want to have those ideas at your fingertips, um, go check out Past and Present. That's why this series, the Past and Present series was born. So um, Christina, back to you. So we have a few people on this call that have experienced sibling loss. And Mary, you mentioned Brad is the oldest of three boys. So could you talk about how your other children coped with the loss of their brother? I think it's very hard for siblings. Um, and they're often, uh, in the case of 9-11, they were overlooked because there was a real focus on the children that lost their parents that day. And, um, and I think kids either wanted to be, you know, take advantage of 9-11 events or they didn't want to be connected with it. Um, the thing that I stress in any family is that everybody goes through it differently. So my grief was much different. I became an activist and had really a purpose where it's very different from my husband and children. Um, I do think the support of their friends is critical and being able to sit with them and you know meet them and talk about what they want to share uh, and that be there to support them. And if I could just add to that, I think Mary, you're absolutely right as far as the support. And I think listening is really important and being there because Shalon lost both her brothers um, before I lost her. And so all my kids are gone, but Shalon got through it with her best friend and just being able to talk. And I think that is a key piece as allowing them to grieve how they grieve and being there for support. The other thing that we're finding is the peer support groups are, uh, you know, 
and the research that we've done, that's been the most helpful. And we're seeing now that um, the young adults who were children on 9-11 are asking for that. So that's one of the services that we're providing. This is a question for Mary and Wanda. Christina, I'm sorry to step on you just for a second, but it's a question that I have, and maybe you both are familiar with it, Mary, uh, because of your work, of course, with the Voices Center for Resilience, you know, um, Wanda for the Maternal Action Project, which is in Dr. Shallon's um, name, um, about how you manage with the joyous memories that you want to have, the memories of perhaps your children um, when nothing uh, was wrong and the future was ahead. And how do you wrestle that with how they died? How do you keep them both? How do you square that? And I wanna start with Mary because the morning of September 11th, um, you had Brad. He was in what may have been his dream job out of college. How do you square and keep the memory of how he died with your memories of how you want to remember him? I would say the passage of time. I know um, right after Brad's death, it was very hard to go to a wedding or a birthday or or even to see his friends' lives progressing, uh, getting married and all the transitions that you have in your life, um, that changed over time. Where now I, I can draw the parallel of where his friends are and gee, they, he could have had children in, in high school right now. Um, one of the projects, the big projects that we worked on is to help the families create a living memorial and we met with the families one by one and collected over 87,000 photographs uh, of their loved ones. And what we found is when they were ready for that, it was a very therapeutic and healing process because with each photograph, they had a story and to be able to, to go through that process was very therapeutic. Um, and to the point about Brad, um, you know, we were well into the project and somebody asked me about Brad's site. And I, <laughs> of course, I hadn't started on his, I was worried about everyone else's. But, but I do think finding ways to keep those memories alive are really important. Mm -hmm. How about you, Wanda? Well, I agree as far as finding memories, keeping memories alive. And I have to do that for Shalon's daughter. Um, she asked me every day, what did mommy do? What, did, what would mommy say? What would mommy wear? What would, and it's, it's like bringing it to life for her, bringing her mom to life for her. And that's important. But as Mary said, it takes time, I guess. And this has only been four years for mm -hmm. me. And so I sometimes, you know, I don't sleep. I still sit and, at night and just think about what could have been, or I just sit and look at her daughter and just remember my daughter. So hopefully I'll get to the place where Mary is in another five or 10 years. But right now, you know, it's just memory, just remembering all of the good times. There don't seem to be any downsides other than the fact that she's not here. And um, it's just a matter of remembering because that I think is the first step to healing. We haven't mentioned, of course, uh, except for the top of our conversation, Damani for grief. And if anyone who is listening wants to have access to courses about how to keep the memory of your loved one alive, um, there are many courses on the Damani for Grief website um, that you can access. Uh, the Damani for Grief also has a community Facebook page if you want to share the story of your loved one, if you wanna post a photograph of your loved one, please join the Damani for Grief community page. Uh, Damani for Grief is also on Instagram. That's another great way of making sure you can say the name of your loved one uh, online to make them have a digital footprint, a digital presence, which I think really helps uh, make sure that your loved one's memory um, endures 
Um, Christina, let's ask a couple more questions. Maybe there's one more that has bubbled uh, to the top for you. Were there any bereaved parent groups that either of you found helpful? For me, I went to um, a bereaved parents work group um, when my first child died. It wasn't that helpful for me, so I did not go back. Um, and I, I, Shalon was my grief counselor when my second son died. And um, I couldn't even face one after I lost her. It's like, they don't, I don't feel like they know exactly where I'm coming from. They haven't walked in my shoes. They don't really understand what it is I need, which is one of the reasons we started Believe Her, an app that also has rooms in it for grandparents like myself who want to go in and talk to someone. It's a peer-to-peer -peer kind of support network. And it's Believe Her, B-E-L-I-E-V-E, -E -E, Believe Her. Her app. Dot com. It's an app. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. And we, we've held um, over 2,200 support groups over the years, and we actually divided them up by um, who the, how they were related to the victim. So siblings with siblings, parents with parents, grandparents with grandparents. And I think probably 9-11 is a little unique in the sense that they have that shared experience, they all died in the same way. And we're seeing the same thing, uh, of course, with the survivors and responders that we're working with. It was, it's that shared experience, which allows them to 20 years later still talk about it. Mm -hmm. And I see in the chat right now, um, enough, enough links that it really is worth your time to explore. I'm seeing uh, a recommendation of looking into the Compassionate Friends. I have spoken at the Compassionate mm -hmm. Friends conferences before. They are a national organization for um, anyone who has lost a child or a grandchild. Um, that is definitely worthwhile to check out. The Believe Her app, of course, that link is now in the chat. Um, we've listed the compassionate friends. Thank you, Christina. I see that you just did that now, the link. And so uh, we are meant to uh, give you some resources during this call. Of course, it's not going to be exhaustive. And there's one piece of advice that I love to give is that there is a pivot point that happens where in the beginning of a loss, we can allow ourselves the flexibility to let's say passively mourn that people generally come to us when loss is new. What happens later, maybe weeks, months, years mm -hmm. after a loss has happened, mm -hmm. if we remain passive, we know that that support that came to us kind of effortlessly when a loss was fresh we really can't count on that anymore. No. And so how can you pivot from passively mourning to actively remembering? That shift for me at least is where so much healing has happened. When you accept that really it's up to you to move forward. It's up to you to keep the memory of a loved one alive. It's up to you to be proactive and to lean in to that uh, memory building. Does that sound right to you, Wanda, too? That does sound very, it rings very true to me. And um, I don't know if this is a good time to share the, the letter that I have from Shalon. Yes. Um, that keeps me going. Um, yes. Okay. Um, this was found on her computer probably four days after she died. Um, and I'll read it. My dearest Beulah Bear, I hope you never have to read this letter. I cannot imagine you having to go through this yet again. And if you are, I am so truly sorry, mommy. In my entire life, I never wanted to cause you any pain. And even right now, it troubles me deeply that you are grieving. I hope you know how much I love you and how much you mean to me. There has never 
been a moment when I haven't felt warm and protected and at peace in your embrace. No matter what storms may have raged in our lives, you were my one true constant, my strong tower. I hope you know that I know you've often wondered if you have done enough for us, but I can't fathom having been born to a different mother and would not trade our memories for anything in the world. I am sorry that I had to leave you. On the particular day that I am writing this, I have no idea how that may have occurred, but know that I would never choose to leave. I know it seems impossible right now, but please do not let this break you. I want you to be happy and smile. I want you to know that I am being watched over by my brothers and grandma, or that we're all watching over you. Please try not to cry. Use your energy instead to feel my love through space and time. Nothing can break the bond we share and you will forever be my mommy and I your baby girl. I love you for always, Lon. So that's the kind of thing. Yeah, I want to hold that moment and not rush past it. I feel like if there's anything that we can do in this space together is give you a moment to feel held and to feel supported. How are you in this moment right now, Wanda, listening, hearing, reading those words? You know, you think that time heals all wounds. It doesn't, it doesn't. You know, it may cover some, it may help with some, but it doesn't heal. And some days it's just as painful today as it was four years ago. I see a lot of nodding heads. I see there are some folks who are wiping away their own tears. And I feel like hearing your daughter is incredibly powerful. And it feels like you can channel her in some ways by rereading that letter. Mary, do you, um, uh, how does that land for you? Um, probably hard to hear another mother's pain so raw. But what a gift she has that her daughter left her a message. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. You know, there are some letters that I have from my mother and my father and just seeing the handwriting or understanding the way they spoke and some uh, phrasing that they had is incredibly powerful. I want to spend the last few moments of us having this time together, the last seven minutes to really talk about Mary more and Wanda more about your organizational missions. And Mary, um, Voices has expanded. It might be surprising for folks here on the call so far to learn that you've actually now are taking on the COVID-19 pandemic. Can you tell us about the coronavirus response mm -hmm. program that you started? Well, um I'll go back to just mention that we changed our name. Um, what we started working on that um, really in 2007 when we saw after the Virginia Tech shooting, the same mistakes being made. So when COVID happened, um, we recognized the parallels. I mean, for people to, to be dying on their own, um, whether they died of COVID or died during COVID, for people to be isolated, for people that have gone through trauma to be traumatized again about the unpredictability of what their future is and the extra stress that these families were going through as they were all working under the same roof, taking care of children, you know, and on and on. So um, it was at that time we decided then it was probably a good time that we changed the name of the organization to better reflect our broader work. I mean, we're still dedicated to helping the 9-11 community. There were 500,000 people that lived, worked, or went to school in Lower Manhattan. 83,000 have life-threatening illnesses, and 4,700 have died since 9-11, so a whole other bereaved po population. 
But that said, simultaneously, we're working with communities impacted by other tragedies. So it could be with nonprofit organizations, federal agencies, and the like. And then we're part of an international network. Um, but like COVID, when there was an attack on the Capitol building, again, a lot of parallels or the social unrest, people felt like they couldn't control the circumstances that were directly impacting them. So um, that's where the parallels are. And we did a lot of programming recognizing that the 9-11 the community and people that have been impacted by other um, tragedies would be uh, more vulnerable um, during COVID. And in terms of folks who are here listening or in the future, again, tell us where we can find you on your website. And I'm sure you are welcoming of uh, volunteers. You're welcoming of support. So before I pass it back on to Wanda, tell us your website again, Mary, so people can help. Yeah, it's voicescenter.org. And, um, you know, we're providing direct services. Uh, we have our annual conference on September 11th. Um, September 9th and 10th, Allison spoke at it again this year and did a fabulous job. Um, and then we're also starting the Living Memorial Project again now for the people that have died since 9-11. Thank you, Mary. And Wanda, in terms of your work uh, with Dr. Shallon's Maternal Action Project, you mentioned the Believe Her app. Um, tell us again your website and then how people can support your work and your mission and what's next for all that you have going on. Um, let's see. Our, I'm sorry, your questions. My, so your website right now where you would want to yes. send people to and how people after this call or who are listening to it later, how can they support you? How can they learn more and do more for you and what your mission is? Our website is um, www.drshalonsmap.org. We are um, very committed to making sure that um, Black women and birthing people have the kind of support information that they need and the feel empowered to push back against um, the racism that they face. One of our primary focuses is on postpartum uh, care and we do support a lot of the um, laws and things that are moving forward, uh, like the Momnibus Act. Ways that people can help would be to donate to Dr. Shalon's map or come to our website and volunteer to work with us on some of our projects. I am so grateful for that. Um, I gave you everyone's. Uh, uh, websites. You, of course, have their social media handles. If you have any questions, you can always reach out to me too. I'm on all social media handles as A. Gilbert Writer. So with one minute to spare, I promise to you to, that we would end on time. Mary Fetchett, Wanda Irving, uh, thank you to Reimagine for, as always, pulling this together. And of course, a special thank you. We would not be here uh, without Domani for Grief. And so I would recommend highly, we talked about the courses about keeping memories alive that are on the Domani for Grief website. I recommend to uh, check those out. And again, go back into this chat see the links that Mary um, has suggested, see the links that Wanda has suggested. And of course, tomorrow, as a reminder, we will send out an email. You will get a replay of this discussion if you had to step away. And we will, again, put all the links to all the websites um, in case you wanna go back and learn more. So it's two o'clock, 11 o'clock Pacific. Have an awesome day, everybody. And I'm so glad you took the time to be with us. And we'll see you, you in October.